problem with the um, reducing the tax rate would be that if we take down the tax rate, the government will not have as much income. And there's a lot of important programs that cuts will have to be made. And as far as Mr. Paloma's plans would work out, the reduction in his plan really just doesn't work out. Because when you do the math, he wants to add five, around five trillion in defense spending that the Pentagon hasn't even asked for. So that would mean that when he raises tax, when he lowers taxes, he would have to make cuts in health care, in a whole lot of other stuff besides roads, bridges, all that, all that, just to add, and that would add two trillion to the deficit, and lowering the tax rate would not help with that at all. Okay, um, the next question is, how do you plan to lower unemployment and Mr. Palmer? I plan to lower taxes, which will stimulate growth. I'll also increase growth of the economy, which will reduce unemployment. Now, I agree with the lowering taxes, but part of Mr. Paloma's plan is to lower taxes to the point that a lot of corporate entities are not paying as far that a lot of money to the government, and that doesn't help because Quite a few of the entities that would get the lower taxes are still going to be shipping jobs overseas to China and tr basically creating a job drain at home, at home in the United States. All right, um, Mr. Childs, how do you plan to lower the unemployment? Well, uh, what I plan to do is I plan to give a $4,000 tax credit to, em to employers that document a, a higher, a, a long-term hiring of full-time employees. So if um, I were to be hired at ACME Corporation for two years, that ACME Corporation would get a $4,000 tax credit. And I would also implement a zero tolerance policy on discrimination. So you can't be discriminated, allowing for more work at home. And also, um, greater access to technical schools, that way people can get trained for the jobs that they already, that are here, but people just don't have trained for. They could, and that would be able to a lot better. And, and I would like to make it so that we export, we don't import items and oil here. So that it leaves us, rather than, we have to import us from other countries. Okay. Um, Mr. Paul, would you like to remind? Yes, I would. Well, first off, we are funding programs such as PBS, which there's no problem with funding PBS. It's a great channel, you know, it's educational and everything like that. But we don't need to be funding money into stuff that we can't be funding. We can't fund stuff that we don't have the money to pay for. And, you know, that's what I have to say to that. Okay. And, um, Mr. Palermo, you will answer this next question first. How will you manage corporate regulations? Okay. First, I'll remove regulations on energy production so we can become energy independent. Second off, we have higher we have higher gas prices than we did four years ago. So we just the gas is going up because we're importing oil. We're importing you know oil from other countries which we don't need to be doing if we have a good oil supply here at home already. So, uh, um, um, I think a lot of my plan would be slightly similar to Romney's plan. It differs in a little, in a few ways, but my main plan is to actually to kind of bump up the current corporate regulations, uh, or mainly just keep them the same, because right now they're doing pretty good and they're making it all work out. But we just need to make sure that corporations are not getting benefits for giving jobs to China. Okay. Well, first off, removing regula corporate regulations would help bring companies here to produce oil from us. 
So it would create more jobs in that sense, instead of having regulations on companies. If we push companies to have higher taxes on them and whatnot, that would drive them away and bring them to America to bring jobs here. All right, the next question is on healthcare, and Mr. Mr. Child, to go first. How has the Affordable Care Act changed the existing healthcare system? Well, the ACA, or Affordable Care Act, has, has changed it by reducing waste, as I've said before, from unnecessary procedures, where I don't need, if I break my leg and I get an x-ray, I don't need an additional MRI to make sure that my leg has a necessary complication, you know it's broken. And that was important. And it also set in place laws on that my, my um, $40 premium a month doesn't go towards giving the CEO a, a $5 million bonus for the year. And it also, the, the insurance companies have to give a justification for increasing our premiums. So they can't just hike the premiums by 40% and say, yeah, we just hiked it by 40%. They have to give a valid, justified reason for that. It also eliminated the lifetime cast on insurance. So if I have cancer, I'm not capped at $5 million for that cancer treatment, for example. And eliminates the denial of coverage on pre-existing conditions. So if I have cancer and I didn't have insurance before and I go to apply for cancer, Bedco Life can't deny my insurance, my uh, application. They have to um, give me coverage. And it also allows young people, such as yourselves, to stay on your parents' health care plan until you are 26, which basically it just guaranteed that right. That was all already a provision of a lot of health care plans, but it just basically just guaranteed that right so that they can't take it away. Mr. Kalama, how will your health care, how will your health care plan differ from the Affordable Care Act? Okay. My final focus is on better regulation of health care with a market-oriented, patient-centered health care plan. people who currently don't have insurance to be able to get insurance at a cheaper rate so that they're not, if they don't, if they already, once again, if they already have cancer, they can get insurance, which previously most healthcare providers would not have guaranteed, would have not have given coverage to someone who already had cancer because they would have considered it too risky of a proposition. And by that same token, it will also allow people already that, it will allow people that can't necessarily afford insurance right now to buy it because it will be cheaper and it will make it easier for people to gain it, get access to coverage, to existing coverage. Yes. Obama is putting excessive regulation on health care, which makes it too expensive. All right. Um, Mr. Palamo, how will your plan affect people without insurance? My plan will be more affordable health care for everyone. It will make it easier for those without health care insurance to afford it. Mr. Childs, um, well, his plan basically is trend. Well, the Ryan plan is moving the moving the uh, existing like Medicare to a voucher system. And the only problem with that is that I'm given a $40 voucher to go buy, a $40 a month to buy insurance. That $40 a month, that $40 a month insurance, when I'm, when I'm 80, might not cover everything I need. And Medicare is a more comprehensive coverage plan. Um, Mr. Childs, how will your plan affect people without insurance? What is the ACA going to do for America? The ACA will once again, it will reduce rates across the board and make it easier for people to buy health insurance. 
and eliminate waste so that we're not, and that means that the tax dollars that go to the waste in hospitals goes to other stuff like um, expansion of jobs or, uh, or building roads, bridges, all that, all that stuff. Because if we're wasting the money, we can't use it. It's dumping it, we're throwing, an MRI for a broken leg is throwing trash, cash into the dumpster. Yes. The ACA Act is adding regulations like Obamacare, increasing costs for everyone. High cost with less benefit is what Obamacare will do for America. And um, Mr. Palomo, how do you plan to implement your health care plan? First, I will repeal Obamacare and put a market-oriented, patient-centered plan. My health care plan reduces government control and regulation. It's market orientation and less regulation. You will see lower costs. Once again, the um, market-centered plan is specifically, uh, for example, for Medicare, would turn existing Medicare into a voucher system, meaning that when I turn 65 and I'm eligible, or whenever I'm eligible for Medicare, I would get a $40 voucher a month. And that $40 today might buy me decent coverage, but in 10 years, that $40 a day, or $40 a month would not buy me decent coverage. It might not cover something as simple as going to the doctor for a sick visit. The next questions are on energy. Um, Mr. Childs, how will you reduce our dependence on foreign oil? Well, my plan to reduce dependence on foreign oil is to invest more in green technology, such as wind energy and solar, and focus on gas, which is not the cleanest thing in the world, but it will. But we have a readily available supply of it, and as long as we do that in an eco ecologically friendly manner, there is a huge supply of it, and it will easily reduce our dependence on foreign oil. And also invest, yeah. Once again, investing in clean tech, clean green technologies, making sure that we're not. And this also has the benefit of keeping the atmosphere clean for our kids in the future. Because I'm not just looking ahead for us right now, as in some, of, some of Mr. Palomo's policies are looking for towards. I'm looking, I'm looking ahead for our children's children. Mr. Yes. Um, first off, green energy is a very, you know, there. It's a good source to use. It's better than using oil because oil it does cause pollution, and that, of course, is very bad as well. And it does have bad stuff, you know, that will affect our atmosphere and then later on for our children's children and whatnot. But the fact is that we don't have the money to fund stuff like that. We don't. We need to create jobs now. Because this is, if we go any further with it, spending, we won't be able to dig ourselves back out of the hole that we're in. We need to start bringing more jobs here by using our oil that we have in our own country to use and create jobs with. We don't need to get, we don't need to spend more money on green energy, which isn't as effective as it is now, as it may be, you know, 10 years later. So. All right, and um, Mr. Palomo, how will you reduce our dependence on the oil? Okay. First off, I'll remove regulations on oil production. Doing this will mean we can provide all of our own oil and reduce regulations. It will reduce the cost of oil as well. We're spending more at the pump now than four years ago. It doesn't need to be that way. Mr. Childs, The only problem with reducing regulations, and I'm not saying that's a silly bad thing, but there's one main problem. If we let an oil company go into, uh, give them a permit and say, do whatever you want in the National Forest, they won't necessarily take up the best practices of ecology 
um, preservation. And there are several precedents for this, because um, oil companies are not necessarily the cleanest, oil is not the cleanest material in the world. As a lot of people may know, it burns down for us, and it, when it gets in the ground, it gets it all water and it can harm us severely. So yeah, I, would, I don't think it's a good idea to reduce regulation. Mr. Childs, how do you plan to utilize green energy? As I said before, I would like to be able to give a, not give a high tax credit, but be able to give a slight tax credit and incentive for people to invest in green energy as far as getting solar panels. And if you were to look at a company like Google, who's doing a great job, they're, um, they're working to make all of their um, network and everything zero emissions. So they are, most of their stuff now is solar powered or it's powered by um, wind energy. And my other goal would be to get more wind energy because it's probably one of the best renewable resources we have. It, it's effective, it's efficient, and the only issue with, with wind energy is the view. It blocks the view. But I mean, I would prefer to have a cleaner atmosphere and maybe just a few wind turbines in my view of the ocean. Mr. Paloma, you are back. Okay. Um, Mr. Paloma, how do you plan to utilize green energy? Okay. Regulations are one of the also one of the things limiting innovation. There's a long term potential for green energy. Instead of short term terms, short term programs like the president has done, I plan on implicating a long-term total energy plan to make us energy independent. Part of the plan is green energy. A small portion of it is. Um, Mr. Childs, rebuttal. Okay, Mr. Childs, what is your opinion on coal? My opinion on coal is pretty simple. I think it's, it's okay, but it's pretty dirty. And there is two words that describe coal, in my opinion, black one. Coal kills. Mr. Paloma, what is your opinion on coal? My opinion on coal is that clean coal is a large part of my total energy, energy independence plan. Yes, coal can be much cleaner, a source of energy than in the past. We need to use our coal so we don't have to use foreign oil as much. Mr. Childs, The only problem with cleaning coal is that to get it out of the ground, it's not always necessarily clean because of the workers. If you think about the actual people behind the distribution network, the people that are in the mines, are, get, have, there are a lot of health hazards involved with mining coal. When I burn it in a power plant, it might, and it's clean, it might not necessarily cause a problem. But when you think about the people who are actually pulling it out of the ground, that's a big issue. The next questions are on foreign affairs. And Mr. Paloma, how are you first? What is your plan for the future of our armed forces? Okay. When America is strong, the, be the world is safer. The best ally world peace has ever known is a strong America. We need to modernize, we modernize our weaponry. Yes, there is a price for strength, but a greater price for weakness, because weakness tempts aggression. Mr. Childs, rebuttal. I 100% agree that we need to protect our country, but the question is at what cost? We're, right now we're doing fine, we're making agreements with Afghanistan and countries that are not necessarily our best friends in the world, but they're coming, they're, they're doing okay. But I re really what I think we need to focus on is we need to pull back and get out of some of the countries that are causing losses for us. Mr. Childs, what is your plan for the future of our armed forces? Well, my plan is 
pretty straightforward. By the year 2014, I would like to be completely pulled out of out of Afghanistan and the Middle East, probably with just remaining people to keep the peace and not probably under the number 500. There won't be a lot of people in there if everything if I'm elected and it goes well, and hopefully it will be peaceful then. And my other plan is to reduce this our spending in in a foreign defense. Because right now, we're spending somewhere in the neighborhood of one to one to two trillion a year. And Mr. Romney's plan is to give them another two trillion. They don't, they don't even think, by forecast, they don't even think they, right now they need the two trillion they're already getting a year. So right now, the foreign affairs to me is a money pit. We're putting money in, we don't need the most advanced missiles because most of the world is an agreement that that stuff is bad. We need to reduce the missiles that we do have and prevent another, prevent a nuclear holocaust. Mr. Yes. Well, first off, I do believe we need a strong military because we do still have enemies in the world that do not like us at all. Like in Libya, with the terrorist attack on our embassy. If we had more security there, we, who knows, we could have saved those lives that were lost. But Obama, but um, President Obama pulled out the, some of the security that was there. And so thus we lost some of those brave people that were in there. But if we could have, the point is though, is that we lose, that we need to have a strong military. Because we need to be able to protect our people that are in other countries and that are in, our, in different embassies. We need to be able to protect our nation. If, you, if we are a weak nation, then other people will then, again try to tempt us. Because if they think they're weak, then they think they can take us over and rule all our lives. Okay, um, Mr. Romney and Mr. Cuomo, do you give Israel your full support? The key to peace in the Middle East is an Israel that knows it will be secure. I will not be a, a fair weather friend to Israel like President Obama. So yes, I give them my full support. Mr. Childs, we have okay. Mr. Childs, do you give Israel your full support? Plain and simple, yes I do. And I can actually give you quite a few precedents from my former president. Um, in Israel, I provided them, for example, with some anti-missile defenses, such as several um, ground stations that will prevent Palestine if they were to ever launch any missiles into Israel, as they've done. Um, as they've done, uh, yeah, so that they won't kill anyone in Israel. And also, I've increased our aid to Israel and given them a long-term commitment to our assistance because we we help them charter their nation. And um, I have maintained a close coordination with Israel on several of their affairs. So yes, I do get my full support to Israel. Yes. Um, Mr. Romney, do you give Israel your full support? Iran is closer to having a nuclear warhead than they ever were before. The fact is, we need to give Israel support because now it doesn't seem like their Iran is a threat to us. But later down the line, once they've taken out Israel and all the other countries, they'll finally make our way to us. And so we need to back Israel, not only because they are one of our strongest allies, but because eventually Iran will become a threat, eventually, with time. Okay, um, Mr. Palamo. What is your plan for Afghanistan and the Middle East? For Afghanistan, I want to ensure it, that we will never again become a launching pad for terror. We must eliminate Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They're not threats to the Afghan government or Pakistan. We must do everything in our power to make sure, again, Iran does not get a nuclear warhead. Mr. Childs, rebuttal. Um, Mr. Childs, what is your plan for Afghanistan and the Middle East? My 
plan for the Afghanistan and the Middle East is pretty straightforward. By um, the year 2014, I would like to have uh, all of our troops out of Afghanistan and the Middle East, except for a small number for peacekeeping purposes and possible Taliban attacks. And I would like to mostly have the Taliban eliminated and probably down and down to not being for a very small number of people. And my goal would it's just to make sure that we keep peace in there and it doesn't become a threat to us ever again. Um, Mr. Here is what our country needs. These are the three points that I feel that our country needs the most in order to have a strong America. Energy independence. By increasing access to domestic energy resources, make it easier to explore and develop our own energy and eliminate regulations destroying the coal industry. Secondly, cut the deficit. By cutting taxes, we will increase growth Growth in the economy will increase our tax base, which will help cut the deficit. In addition, smaller government will reduce government spending. And last, strong America. We must, have, we must be strong in order to actively promote world peace, as well as we need to actively promote democracy, instead of passively waiting for democracy to take hold. If we do these things, we will be much better off than we are now. Um, Mr. Childs, my plan for America, if I'm reelected for my next, for another term, is pretty simple. I would like to continue to increase job growth as I already have, and make sure that we secure our future as a world power by in, by increasing our economic production and and defense, making sure that we defend ourselves appropriately, but not taking it out of hand by spending a ridiculous amount of defense because we don't need to we don't need to spend a lot of money on the best defense in the world. And my and I would also, as I've said before, make sure that um, the Affordable Care Act is implemented properly and that everybody has equal equal opportunity to access health care and the right to life. So that we prevent ourselves from so that we prevent ourselves from getting sick, and we can live long, productive lives. And my, and, also, and my commitment to green energy, making sure that we preserve the Earth's environment and are good stewards of it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Chavez, do you have any questions? I do. <laughs> what is uh, what is your party's plan for position on Roe versus Wade, and what is your personal conviction on Roe versus Wade? <laughs> I would like both candidates to respond, please. Okay, I'm trying to remember what Roe versus Wade is about. Yeah. Abortion. Oh, abortion, that's what I was trying to think. Abortion all the time. So my stance is that as uh, is that everyone had everyone should have equal and act opportunity to health care, and that does include abortions. Now, as far as that is concerned, I do not believe that if somebody decides to go and have sex before they're married, they and they get pregnant, I believe that they do not have the right to go and get an abortion. But what I do believe they have the right to do is in cases of rape and, um, and, and if it's threatening to the mother's life, I believe that that is proper grounds for an abortion. So that's your personal position? Yes, that is my personal position. Do you know the party's position? Well, no, 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 that, well, the party's position is that they believe that abortion should be allowed if someone chooses to. And also, my first position, I'm even a little iffy on the mother, if it's harming the mother's health, but yeah. That, that's, the, my part of the position is everyone should have the right to an abortion, no matter what. That's my first position. Yeah, spoke from the Republican candidate. Well, my personal opinion on this is that I don't believe there should be abortion. And 
of course, in some cases as rape or the harming of a mother's life, that, you know, of course, it may seem like that, but when it comes to the life of a child, that is the gift from God. And you never know, that kid may become the President of the United States or be the next Steve Jobs or the next Bill Gates. You can't, a uh, kid's life is always important. But, yeah. So my party's platform is the same as my, platform, my personal platform on this. So. Does anyone else have any questions? What are you going to do for the people who are fed by the hurricane? I'll go. I'll go first. Yeah. Okay. First off, of course, I think we should do everything in our power to help the people affected by Sandy. The very reason that, one, they got hit by a hurricane that, they don't get hit by a lot of hurricanes, so they were basically unprepared for this hurricane. So that there's a lot of damage done, and a lot of people have lost their homes and have lost, you know, consider about, consider it, consider it, yeah, a lot of stuff. So, yeah, you know, a lot of people lost their homes, their jobs. I was watching the news this morning, and people that were trying to go to, to New York to go to their jobs, they had like a traffic stop, so they had to check, because they're only allowed to have three people per car. And there was like backed up, like maybe like five miles backed up of traffic, like all the way backed up. And so, yeah, we definitely need to push more to help Sandy and help New York and all the East Coast to help with that. Thank you. Well, and, and if you watch the news, I've done quite a bit so far to help and assist the um, flood, the uh, hurricane victims. And by implementing FEMA and making sure that we fund that we funnel money towards the um, to the east to a, towards the New England region, so that they are able to rebuild effectively and prevent any and make sure that the next time this will, this will happen, because climate change is a reality, and we need to make sure that we prevent we protect the buildings because this will likely happen again, and the next time it happens, it will come back with a greater ferocity, and it will destroy everything. So we need to make sure that we use this as a learning lesson so that the next time this happens, it does not can destroy everything. Are there any other questions? That's good. <laughs> okay, so my main plan is cuts, cuts, cuts. Eliminating waste and not necessarily consolidating the government, but there are several government entities that could probably do with a little bit less funds. And I, once again, I point to the Pentagon in that they are getting money that they even save themselves, but they don't necessarily need. Well, first off, we definitely need, of course, to cut government spending. Of course, you know, spending like funding program, programs such as PBS, programs like that. But I do believe we still need a strong military force, but we do need to cut back on funding programs that we don't need to really fund. So that's one way, that's how I plan to cut, you know, to get the deficit lower. Any more questions? Um, how would you stop people that are, if there's a drought that's going to come, if there's a drought from getting looked up for not dying? How would you? Okay, well, in case there's a drought, you know, we must always, you know, take measures to make sure we have water resources. Because that's, you know, we're, our body's made up of about 70% water, so it's something that we directly need to survive. And so they do have, like, water treatment plants in California that use the salt water to purify it, to get the salt out and use the water. 
So that's some of the stuff that is looking into, but usually, you know, you get water from lakes and stuff like that. And usually it's not, it's not, so far it hasn't been like extreme, extremely big problem, something that we desperately need help on, but it has been a problem. I know that for sure, especially with the wheat and the growing of crops that have been, so far wheat crops have been pretty bad this year. And so, yeah, that's not a big problem. Well, as far as um, the drought goes, my main concern would be making sure that there is an effective way for those farm farmers that are farming the grain and farming all that to get back on their feet after the drought. Because there's not much we can really do to help make the drought go by any faster besides like making sure that everyone's providing water and everyone's conserving water appropriately. But we need to make sure that after after the fact, everybody can get back on their feet easier through FEMA and other government programs that would all up give make it easier for farmers to receive subsidies on their plants and, and stuff like that. Can you answer one more question? All right. What are y'all? Oh. What y'all gonna do to help low income families get to college? Well, um, my plan is by the year 2014, college tuitions would have gone down by about 40 percent, rather than as they continue, rather than continuing to go up, and so that they will, so that everyone has equal opportunity access to gain access to college. Because if we make it easier, because there are jobs out there, just the part, just the main issue with them not being able to get jobs is experience and training. And I would like to make it easier for people to get, get protected to buy low income tuition and make it, and rather than have, make people being stuck in debt for the rest of their lives, make it easier for them to get grants and um, scholarships. So, and part of that is also lowering college tuition. Uh, you know, I plan to do similar to what the, what the uh, president or the speaker to the president has said, I plan to, you know, lower tax, lower, you know, taxes and whatnot, and, you know, to try to help families that need, they're in trouble with college, because college is an important aspect of life. It, tuition is always an important thing, it is what, you know, knowledge is what basically our society runs around, is having much knowledge, how much you have, and what can you do to help society, and what can you do to, for your country. So that's what I believe. I want to thank these gentlemen for their presentation today. I hope that's been informative for you all. Now, obviously, everything that was shared up here today, there could be questioned. Okay, it comes from a political perspective, uh, and we talk about percentages and we talk about amounts of money. Okay, unless you're very well read about these kind of things, it would be hard to question that. But there are some things that could be questioned. Okay. But what you need to do now is you need to do two things. One, you need to determine which one of these gentlemen won the debate today by choosing a blue or red square and placing it in the uh, bucket back there. You also need to vote, everyone in here, either for Mr. Romney or Mr. Obama, if you would do that, please. Let's give these young men a good hand.